Welcome to the Shield on Hoops podcast. We got Nick Peckham here today. Uh, along myself, we're going to give you a little bit different of a podcast uh, today. You know, we're going to take a look at the state of the ACC kind of on the national landscape um, coming into ACC play. I think there are three or four games on Saturday and Syracuse versus Pitt is one of those. So we'll be talking about um, just where teams are right now, records and rankings at this point of the season. You know, at this point now, most teams have 10, 11, 12 games of data. And um, it's kind of skewed a little bit because, you know, some non-conference schedules are a little bit tougher than others. But trends are definitely starting to emerge that makes sense to kind of look into. So um, as the season goes on, uh, like last year, as the season went on, about five or six games in the ACC play, I just ditched everything else and just did conference games only. Um, which I think is the, is the best way to kind of rate teams within the conference because, again, you're playing each other. And, again, we all know that schedules are weighted certain ways, but, you know, we just do the best we can with the numbers that we have. So today we're going to take a look at each team, uh, see where they kind of stand in different metrics nationally, uh, kind of talk about what has surprised us or what hasn't surprised us. And then we're going to take a look at Syracuse's schedule, see how that pans out and make some predictions on where we think the orange finish this season. So um, yeah, plenty to talk about and we'll just talk about Pitt in the next pod. But uh, for this one, we're going to knock uh, some of these, some of these out. Um, all right. So what I kind of did, and if you follow me on Twitter, you probably saw this or you can go back to it. What I did to kind of rank the teams one through 15, and we'll kind of use that as a guide is I took um, four rankings. I took Ken Palm, I took Torvik, I took uh, Evan Maya, and I took their net rankings and just kind of put them all into one and divided it by four to get an average rank to see where each team stands. And that's how I kind of sorted teams out. So right now, as we speak, you know, Duke is number one, Carolina's number two, Clemson's three. That seems to be the top. That seems like to be tier number one right now in the ACC, those three teams, Duke, Carolina, Clemson. Uh, then you got UVA at four. Pitt at five, Virginia Tech at six, Miami at seven, Wake at eight, um, and then NC State nine, Boston 10, Syracuse 11, Florida State 12, Georgia Tech 13, Louisville 14, and Notre Dame 15, right? There's a pretty big jump from Syracuse to Florida State. There's a pretty big jump um, from Clemson to UVA as well. So, um, yeah, so that's where we are right now. Um, I don't have in front of me where – rankings started but there's a little bit of movement there and some teams that are a little bit better than um i I'll, I'll talk my we'll just talk real quick your your biggest positive surprise and biggest negative surprise i would say that i thought they're going to be pretty good um but clemson being as high as they are right now i'm kind of surprised by in a positive way um they kind of beefed up their schedule a little bit and they lost a tough one to memphis but other than that, they've been unscathed so far. And them ranking at an average of 22, I don't think I would have ranked them that high coming into the year. But um, I think that they are at – they're about as good as I thought they would be, but I, I just didn't think they'd be that ranked ranked that highly. And I think my negative um, surprise was how bad Notre Dame is. Um, like I knew they'd struggle. You know, they lost J.J. to us, and um, they – just you know, new coach coming in, a lot of guys graduated, Cormac went to Carroll. So, like, I knew they'd be bad. I didn't think they'd be this inefficient as they are right now. And they're having their own drama, right? You know, I saw Shrewsbury was, you know, he's over there being like, you're not going to play hard, get out. Now I'll, I'll sign your transfer, <laughs> your, your transfer forms now, all those things. So those are kind of mine. What are your, uh, what are your overall thoughts, Nick, so far? And what do you kind of feel are – it's, it's a team that maybe has surprised you. Um, I'll say also I'm surprised Virginia Tech is so high, but we'll get back good to them as well. Um, and maybe a team that has kind of let you down as far as where you thought they would be this year. Yeah, um, I got to go with you on Clemson. Um, I did – obviously, when you look at Clemson's overall team, like on paper, they have a lot of dudes on that team that are, they are very good. So, like – Putting it together was kind of a, a big concern. Like, how are they going to put all these pieces together and figure it out? Well, they've done that quick and they've done that very efficiently. Um, yeah, so and, would be, to interrupt you, I think, I think a lot of that. I think a lot of that was they didn't. I don't think people were sure where JG three was going to fit. Yeah, like they knew he could shoot, but like where does he fit at Clemson, kind of thing. So, 
they figured it out, like you said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, losing Hunter Tyson and then getting a guy like JG3, I know they don't play the same position, the same type of ball, but losing a three-point shooter and getting another one of JG3 cal- JG3's caliber to come in and kind of replace that was a huge thing. Um, PJ Hall has taken a massive step this year as opposed – Last year he was very good, right? But he had his ups and downs. This year he seems like it's a consistent every night. This is what you're going to get. He's going to play hard. Um, And you kind of saw glimpses of that last year, and this year he really put it together. So um, Clemson being this high this early kind of surprised me. I did think they would be good, but I thought it would take some time later in the season, like start an ACC play middle, kind of go on that run. But they've knocked him out. Uh, early. Um, I know they have, um, I don't, I know when they were undefeated until they played, Mem- was it Memphis? Yeah, they lost, by, they lost by two to Memphis. Yeah, and then Memphis came in, who Memphis as well is, I know they're not in the ACC, but they're another team that's uh, really gelled um, very quickly. Yeah. Um, my one disappointment, um, I know I've talked about it on here on some of our pods before, um, Louisville. Um, I know like when you look at last year, they were very, uh, it was very disappointing. Um, they had L Ellis. He was like their best player, uh, averaged a double figures. He was like one of the top ACC players at the end of the year, but like the rest of their team kind of wasn't there. Uh, guys left. They kind of brought in some guys. They added some new pieces to the coaching staff. Um, it kind of seemed like the guys that came in, um, they were guys that like could help in areas they struggled in, but losing what they lost and not really replacing that kind of uh, put them in a hole. But, I mean, they're not as bad right now as Notre Dame, um, but they're pretty bad. Uh, It's It seems like the sky is falling in Louisville already, Um, and this is Kenny Payne's – he's in, what, 11 or 12 games into his second season. So, like, I don't know how much time they give him. I don't know what the AD is thinking over at Louisville, but that's kind of been a disappointment this year. Um, and I, I will say one other thing. The, uh, I got two kind of surprises. Um, Pitt being where they're ranked, um, saying how much they lost last season. Um, we all know Pitt had a great year last year, a remarkable year, um, but they lost a lot, right? They lost Nellie Cummings, who was a major piece at point guard for them. They lost Greg Elliott, who was kind of like – he wasn't uh, – on a superstar per se, but he was a dude that played significant in his role. He locked up uh, their best wing def- or wing player on most teams slash guard. And then uh, he was one of the top three point shooters in the ACC. So kind of losing your backcourt. Um, I know Blake, Hin- Blake Hinson returned, uh, obviously the two twins returned and they, they played sparingly last year. Uh, their center came back after kind of getting hurt at the end of last year. So just kind of putting the new pieces together and especially having, a true freshman play at point and playing the way he is playing. Um, you kind of, you're kind of not missing that Nelly Cummings that was at your point guard last year, but uh, Pitt's been kind of a surprise uh, to start this year as well. And uh, I will say the one thing that um, obviously you knew they were going to be good, but um, seeing how last season went for North Carolina, um, bringing back four of the starting five of a team that lost in the championship game, uh, having probably one of the worst years of any team recently who had the expectations that they had, um, and then kind of rebuilding. Uh, I know they brought back R.J. Davis. They brought back uh, Armando Baycat, but adding guys like Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan and Jalen Withers from Louisville, um, getting Elliot Cadeau coming in as a freshman and being as good as he's been so far in the limited playing time, it's kind of been surprising how quickly they've put that together. Um, it seems like guys really fit, and it seems like the pieces that were kind of there last year, are. it, it kind of reminds you of why they didn't play as well. So um, those were those are probably my two surprises so far. I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll add this one. I think Miami's been a disappointment so far. Um, I think that it, based on what was kind of expected of them, um, they got some decent wins, uh, but their two losses, which have been the two top 25 teams in Ken Palm, we're both by like 20 plus, like breaks blown off, like just taken out to the back half. Like they've been handled in their two losses pretty bad. So it's just that's kind of alarming to me. I'm not sold on them. Um, I have another question for you. Who is your sleeper, right? Not to win the conference, maybe, but to maybe like jump higher than most people may accept. 
may like kind of expect at this point. Mine, I know mine. Do you want to go first? Or you want to go second? I'll go first. I'll go first. I got right. so I got two. Um, see if you still no, you only get one. You get one. I got one. Okay. 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 Well, I have two in mind, okay. but I'm gonna go with um the one that I think um they're kind of middle of the pack. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Wake Forest as my sleeper. I think same. Uh, same. Same. I, I I watched them play the other night. They were on. Uh, they weren't really playing uh, like a great competition, but they kind of started off very slow. It was a tight uh-huh. game, and then like uh, Steve Forbes kind of called a timeout, and like I don't know if it clicked, but like the dudes came out of the huddle and they just kind of went. They just ran away with it, right? And um, they kind of got. I, I don't know how to say this, but it, it, when you watch their team, they kind of have a, a team that you could see make a deep run in the NCAA tournament, right? They got uh, – I don't know if they start this normally, but when I was watching their game the other night, uh, they started two bigs. They had two – I think one – they may both be seven foot, but I don't know if they're both at that level. But um, one of them kind of steps out and shoots threes. The other one's kind of more of a post player. Uh, they got some very good guards. They have a, a – a guy who I, I didn't—he didn't play in this game. I don't know if he's still hurt. I know he got hurt last year, but I think his name was Bobby uh, Cl- Clitman or something. He's uh, one of the foreign kids over there. Uh, He's—I know, like on NBA boards, he's projected top ten, top fifteen pick. Uh, he's kind of a, a forward who can step out and shoot threes as well as get to the rim. Um, but when you look at their overall team and seeing the job that Steve Forbes has done since he's been at Wake Forest, it kind of fits one and one that they're going to figure it out and eventually go on this little run in the ACC. Yeah. They got some dudes. The Salas kid from Gonzaga is hooping right now. He's tough. Hildreth is that tough. Was, that was a big, um, I was on Twitter and there was a lot of people talking about how, even though Gonzaga is playing very well, uh, seeing what um, he's doing over at Wake Forest and what could have been, if he stayed in Gonzaga, that was like a big loss people are talking about for them. Well, the other one is the Reed kid from – he's from Gonzaga too. And he he just got back. I think he just got – I think he got a waiver pass or something. He was – so he started at LSU. Yeah, yep. Then went yeah. to Gonzaga. And then he's original, he's, yeah, he's a Virginia kid. And so he's coming along too. So, I mean, like they got some dudes that can play, right? They they got some dudes that can play. I think they're going to be a problem. Um, yeah, right, Hild- Hildreth is a guy to really – um if you he's, don't really know ACC or much about Wake Forest, uh, Hildreth is a guy to watch for um, come ace, first team all ACC at the end of the season. He is a guy who, when he can get going, he can get going with the best of them in college. So He's got that Devendorf vibe to him, as in, like, you freaking hate him. But if he's on your team, like, you're like yeah, – I, I love dude. it, right? Yeah. I do, <laughs> right? Like, you need, you need those guys. So – um, all right, since you stole that one, that was gonna be mine. Uh, I think my next one's BC. I think BC has wow, a chance. That's crazy. To be, I think BC has a chance to be pretty good. They got some good pieces. Um, I'm not sold on NC State. Um, I just not. Was, I don't know. That BC was my other one. And yeah, I, 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 I say BC only because they played they played good to start this uh, non conference. Um, and having a guy at head coach in Damian Stoudemire who's been around, that's, who's that's coached at the NBA. NBA level and things like that. Like that's a huge thing for these college kids. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think Boston has a chance to be pretty good. Um, Let me throw one team at you. I want to know what you think. Um, what do you think about Georgia tech heading into ACC play? I don't know. I mean, they beat Duke, which I mean, that's something that as a Syracuse guy, I would absolutely take. Um, I mean, they have some, they have a puzzling loss to UMass Lau, um, Lowell, Lau, whatever. They lost to Cincinnati by 35. They lost to Georgia by 14. They lost to Nevada by eight. So, I mean, like, they got some puzzling stuff on there, but they also have a win over 29 Mississippi State, seven Duke. Um, they beat UMass and Penn State. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I have – I'll be honest when I say I have not seen them play yet. I haven't Josh, even watched the – Josh Pastner is still not there, right? No, that's, that's Stoudemire. Well, yeah. he's at Georgia Tech. Yeah, you're talking. You're talking about. Earl, you're talking about Earl Grant at. Uh, Earl BC. Grant is at BC. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, he's yeah he's a BC guy. Um, yeah, but I mean, they. I don't know. I, I got to watch Georgia Tech play uh, to know more about them. But I mean, again, they beat Duke by four at home. So I mean, you, you got to imagine they're at least capable 
of, of something, right? Like, yeah, I mean, they're I also wouldn't be surprised if Florida State got a little bit better too. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be, I think it's very interesting because again, I think you got Duke, Carolina, and Clemson as your top tier right now. And then outside of that, I mean, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight teams ranked 40 to 82, like right in there in the middle. So a lot of things that can happen. All right, let's go team by team here. Let's talk about Duke to start. All right, we just talked about Georgia Tech. Um, Duke is currently sitting, if you average everything together on the Shields ratings, um, they are at 13 and a half. Um, they have losses against Arizona, Arkansas, and that Georgia Tech game. They don't have a lot of big wins. I mean, they beat 18 Baylor. They beat 21 uh, Michigan State, both in neutral games. There have been a, a couple of cupcakes and decent 100 ranked type teams in there. So they've been, I mean, I think the only thing, the really surprising losses there, I think would have been the Arkansas and the Georgia Tech games um, for them. Those are both road games. Um, but, you know, efficiency-wise, they look pretty good. And they are they have a fairly decent gap as far of as being ahead of everybody else in the conference right now. So I, I still think they're the team to beat in the conference, even though they're jumping into this, uh, into the new year, probably 0-1 um, after that. Well, really, they'll, their first, their second conference game is going to be Syracuse. So um, what are your thoughts on Duke? I think, and, and look, they lost, they lost, uh, the Proctor kids has been out and they've been playing better with him out. So um, I don't, I don't know what that means. Duke's another one I haven't, I haven't watched a lot. I just can't stand them enough to like, their social media profiles are so cringy that it makes it so hard to even like turn on a game um, for me to like watch them play. Like it just, it just think about them like dancing on TikTok and so it, it just drives me nuts. So I, it's just, it's very difficult for me to, to even like watch them play um, unless I'm invested in the game. So whatever. I mean, I know we're talking about the ACC or trying to be unbiased here, but I just, it's just hard for me to, to, get, to get behind watching them play. But um, that being said, obviously, the, the, I still think they're the best team in the conference right now with Carolina kind of close behind. What are your thoughts on Duke? Yeah, so I've watched – I will say I've watched a couple of Duke games this year, unfortunately. They've just – They give you no choice. They're on every freaking night. They've been on. But I watched the Michigan State game, which was um, – they do this thing every year where it's Kentucky, Duke, Kansas, Michigan State. <laughs> And they all kind of play each other. They rotate, whatever. And then I watched the Baylor game. Um, but I, I, you did mention Tyrese Proctor. He has been out for a little bit. Um, from what I'm hearing, he probably won't be back, uh, at least for the Syracuse game. He's still two, two and a half weeks away um, from playing. Uh, whatever, it doesn't matter at the at the end of the day. But um, uh, it's a different Duke team than what you've we've seen in the past, right? It's um, they, I mean, when usually when you think Duke, it's loaded with uh, five-star freshmen, uh, dudes that can really hoop and things like that. And yes, they have those five-star freshmen, but um, it's kind of uh, a, a team that brought back guys from last year that um, kind of surprised a lot of people, right? Like Kyle Fobkowski came back. Um, he was a projected top 15 pick in the NBA. He came back to Duke. Um, right now he's starting at center. Um, whereas opposed to years before you had guys like Mark Williams or you had big guys who could really do damage defensively. And then they kind of, um, lobbed the ball up offensively, had some putbacks, things like that. Um, but they're kind of a more of a veteran team this year, which is kind of unique for Duke. They, they don't usually have a lot of veterans that play significant minutes, um, but they have Kyle Fokowski came back, uh, Mark Mitchell came back. Uh, Jeremy Roach, who was huge for them down the stretch last year, uh, yeah. is back and he's playing just as good as he did last year to end the year. Um, Ryan Young, um, I watched the Baylor game the other night, or uh, not the other night now, it was probably a week ago, but uh, Ryan Young came off the bench. He only played, he came in for like a five minute spurt, had four points, four rebounds, two assists, and he was just all over the floor. Um, so to see that and like, he didn't really play much else other than that five minute stretch, but he came in and he made his money's worth. Um, it's kind of unique to see. And obviously, like I said, they have some five stars. They have Jared McCain. They have these guys um, that came in and obviously they're just as good as anybody else. But um, one thing I will say is Duke has, I think Duke has yet to hit 
their full potential yet. And obviously they've had guys in and out of their lineup. So like they haven't really played with their full team yet. So um, if Syracuse were to get them at any point, and I know I say this about a lot of games, right? But um, we, we kind of said it about the Oregon game as well. Um, this would be the game, right? Early in the ACC play, it's it, it's really – this is kind of really the start of ACC play. I know every team has played in one game already, but to get them, like, in their first matchup in the ACC play is kind of like – it's better than getting them when we usually play them at Valentine's Day weekend, halfway through where Duke's rolling on all cylinders and things like that. So, um, obviously, it's in Cameron. Um, it's going to be a tall task. Uh, we have one in Cameron. Um, I'll never forget Elijah Hughes hitting the three-quarters court shot. Um, and then we kind of came out at halftime and ties battle and Pascal Chuku had huge second halves and things like that. But um, this would be one of those games where um, just to watch out for, right? And I'm not saying Syracuse is going to go into Cameron and win, but it's just one of those games where Duke might not be at full strength. They really haven't hit their stride. Um but if Syracuse can play how we've seen them play in spurts recently, um, they can hang around, right? But I'm not don't I'm not gonna say they're gonna sit here and say they're gonna win this game. But um, this would be a time when you would really want to play Duke. You're the eternal optimist. Um, <laughs> I, I try, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, second right second right now is is Carolina. So Duke was at 13 and a half as an average. Carolina's at 19. Okay, so. I think Carolina is also an interesting case. Uh, like their losses are to 24 Villanova, number five UConn, number 19 Kentucky. Um, and they were kind of in all those games. UConn, you know, w- ended up winning by 11, but they put 100 up on Tennessee, which is like one of the top five defenses in the country. Um, so, like, that's, that's a pretty impressive uh, a feat there. It shows you what they're capable of. Uh, they have wins over. They beat Arkansas, and they also beat uh, twenty five Oklahoma, which is a pretty bit, a pretty good, pretty solid win um, uh, a couple of days ago. So uh, they don't start conference play until the second um, when they head over to Pitt. So um, yeah, I, I think they're, night. So they they yeah, play, they, 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 yeah, they, play, they have a ninety nine point seven percent chance to win based on Ken Palm numbers against Charleston Southern. So. Um, Tempo's pretty good. They're at 33 like we usually are. Um, they're taking care of the ball. They're getting to the foul line a lot. They're not rebounding offensively like a Carolina team typically does, but they are like a top 75 three-point shooting team, and they're you know they're just doing things that Carolina does. Uh, again, you got guys like R.J. Davis and Armando and Cormac Ryan. Like they got a bunch of guys who can kind of play and shoot. I don't love their bench. Um, I mean, they're obviously they're four or five stars on the bench, but um, I do think that starting five is pretty solid yeah. and tough, right? And, and tough. I, I, yeah, and we'll talk about matchups later. But I mean, tenth best offense, forty first best uh, ranked defense. Uh, right now, bracketology has him as a four seed, and they also have Duke as a four seed. So, um, just again, take that for what you want. But uh, currently, just in case you're wondering, they got six ACC teams in. They got Duke, Carolina, Clemson, UVA. Virginia Tech is the last team in, I think, and Miami. So that's who uh, ESPN kind of has in right now. But Carolina, they have a, they have them as as a four seed um, as well. So yeah, I mean, I, I do like Carolina. I think Carolina has almost just as much of a chance as Duke does to to kind of win the regular season title. Uh, it could be a scheduling thing. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun watching Duke Carolina play this year. Um, and I just think – I think they're one of the three teams, along with Clemson, um, that everybody else is chasing. So, thoughts on thoughts on the heels? Yeah, I've, um, I've watched a lot of North Carolina, obviously, just like Duke. They're kind of on TV all the time. Um, but I did uh, – when Syracuse used to be in the Big East, my dad was a huge North Carolina fan. He grew up watching, obviously, Michael Jordan play at North Carolina. So, like, that was his thing. So, I watch, I've always been, like, a – kind of a North Carolina fan. I've always rooted. Obviously, when we were in the Big East, I, I, that was my team in the ACC was North Carolina. Um, but now that we're in the ACC, I, I'm always going to work for Syracuse. But uh, hate those guys. <laughs> but watching North Carolina play this year, yeah. I mean, the stats kind of say it all, right? And you kind of said it. The three losses, they were in every game. Uh, UConn kind of went on a run at the end and pulled away. Yeah. Um, the Kentucky game, they had a turnover 
down three. Um, oh, that's right. That's right. Set, that's they right. kind of set up a play, and Cormac Ryan came off a screen, and Cadeau threw him the ball, but he wasn't paying attention, and it bounced off his back. Yeah, that was um, not off a screen. He was just running on the court. He just threw it at his face. So, <laughs> I mean, yes, they they are. Um, they, they've been in every game, right, that they've mm-hmm. lost, and then they obviously have beat some very good teams as well. Um, they bring back two all ACC caliber players and RJ Davis and Armando Baycott. Um, like you said, their starting five is very good. Um, and their bench, yes, they're, I, I think a bench, right? And I look at the way Syracuse's bench is playing. And like a lot of these guys don't have, like, they're not playing the way that Syracuse bench has been playing in the last three games, right? And yes, like you said, they have four and five stars coming off their bench. They have Elliot Cadeau, who is probably the one of the top guards coming into this year. Uh, yeah. Jalen Withers, Jalen Washington. Um, they have dudes that can hoop coming off their bench. Um, Paxson Wojcik uh, is another guy who kind of transferred in. But um, I will say, watching them play, um, outside of Zach Eady, and obviously he's putting up crazy numbers at Purdue, uh, I think R.J. Davis might be uh, – the, the way he started this season could be up there on that Zach Eady level right now. Um, with the way he's st- played so far in college basketball. I've watched a lot of their big games. Like, I watched the Kentucky game. Um, I watched some of the Oklahoma game. And, like, R.J. Davis is getting to his spots, hitting shots at a high rate, getting his teammates involved. It just looks like a different R.J. Davis running the point as opposed to kind of having to play off off of slash with Caleb Love like last year. Yeah, he just might be – he might just some, – some guys just do better as the feature. You know what I mean? And one thing I will say, you kind of mentioned uh, North Carolina's rebounding numbers. And, like, usually when you think of North Carolina, they crash the offensive glass and they out-rebound most teams every night, right? Um, They don't have the size that they usually do. Um, Obviously, they have Armando at the five. But at the four, they they play Harrison Ingram, who's not – he's like a shorter four as opposed to what you normally see. Um, But as ACC play rolls on, I'm sure those rebounding numbers – yeah, will gradually improve, but they they're usually not like when you think of the last couple of years they've had. Uh, last year they had Pete Pete Nance Jr. next to Armando, so they had two big guys down there. Uh, the year before they had Brady Manick, who I know when you think of Brady Manick, he was a shooter, but he also rebounded the ball at a pretty high rate. Um, and then like the year before they had Dayron Sharp, who's now in the NBA, Walker Kessler, who's in the NBA. They had like this loaded center room. But that's usually – usually they have these big guys that they roll in. This year they just don't have that height like like normal. Yeah, I think I think they're more skilled though this year. I think they're pretty pretty skilled. Um, I've been impressed with them so far. Uh, so right on their heels is Clemson. All right, so Carolina's at 19 with the average. Clemson's at 22. Um, Bracketology has them as a three seed right now. So when you look at this Clemson schedule so far, now they got two cupcakes on there, right? They had – 311 Alcorn and 273 Queens. But outside of that, they had every game's within the top 170, 150 of Ken Palm, which most teams just don't do that, right? Like, and they've got one, two, three, four, five. They have five top 100 wins right now, right? They got Bo- a win over Boise, uh, 71 Boise, eight Alabama on the road, 45 Pitt on the road, 67 South Carolina at home. And then 37 TCU neutral. They lost to 32 Memphis by two, but Memphis is again. Memphis is one. Memphis is going to be one of those March Madness Cinderella favorite picks um, yep. when it's all said and done. So they're good. Um, they play Miami on the third on the road. That'll be interesting. I'm interested to see what that looks like. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it, they play Miami, Carolina, Virginia Tech, and Boston. The next four games and they in ACC play, but they uh, again twenty third ranked offense, thirty seventh ranked defense. We know all about Joe Girard having a great year. PJ PJ Hall is a problem for everybody. He can kind of do a lot of different things and hurts you in a whole bunch of different ways. His numbers nationally are just good efficiency wise. A six ten senior, Girard's having a great year. He's shooting forty four point seven percent from three. Shooting 44% from two, 90.6 from the foul line, um, taking care of the ball. Like he's thriving over there um, with a point guard who's like a, a little more of a distributor than Judah kind of was. Um, Chase Hunter is good for them. 
I mean, they got age, man. They're, they're old for, for, for college basketball. Those three are, are seniors or grads. Uh, Chef, Shifflin, Shefflin, he's tough. Um, I think he's one of those guys who I would, would just love to have on the roster at Syracuse. Like, that's the kind of – like, again, he's not going to, like, dominate a game, but he's just involved in everything. He's like Malik if Malik was, like, jacked. You know what I mean? Or, like, stronger. You know what I mean? So, he kind of reminds me of um, the, a couple of years ago, but Tyler Roberson. Like exactly. Guy, like, that just got rebounds. Like, he wasn't involved in the offense or anything like that, but he set screens. He defended. He got rebounds. He yeah, dove he on the floor for the loose ball. He was, like, the team, the team player. Yeah, and then they got Jack Clark coming back now, getting back in the flow, or he was injured. So him and Way, so they got some. They're like they're not at full strength right now, and they're they're just they I they they want to play a specific way, or Coach Burnett, Burnett Brownell does, and they do. Like they're a top twenty three point shooting team. They're top twenty offensive efficiency. They don't turn it over. They make you grind in the half court. They kind of play in the gaps. They don't take a lot of chances. They make you make tough shots. So like they are – it's. it feels like this is what kind of Brownell has been kind of like trying to build towards as what his identity for Clemson basketball is. Like this is like the best example for them, right? And I think the Gerard pickup was huge for them. Like we said earlier in the pod, it's just – I don't think people knew where he fit or they were like, oh, but Gerard can't play defense. He's doing just freaking fine, okay? Like he's fine, okay? Like – He's doing it. He's, he's all right, okay? Um, maybe the zone was the worst thing for Joe Girard as far as defense. And, again, we saw Judah last year. Like, I know Girard got a lot of flack, but Judah was not good in the zone last year either, right? Like, they, they were bad in different ways. Like, Girard was just kind of slow. Judah was over-aggressive and forced Syracuse to play 5-4 on four a lot, which he's currently doing now too. Um, you know, taking those silly – if you know if you know me, you know I can't stand the silly half-court gambles. Uh, but hey, they do lead to a highlight every now and then, so that's fantastic. But I just think that those things will catch up with Syracuse if they don't stop doing them. Um, but I digress. So Clemson, I think, um, could make a run depending if they get some big wins. Um, I like them. I just don't know if I like them enough to say that they're going to take down Duke and Carolina. Like. I know I said like the, those three are in the same tier, but it's almost like tier AA and then like tier AB is Clemson there. So I do think Clemson has is is fairly far ahead of everybody else in the ACC. I just don't know if they're up there. So I don't know what your thoughts are Clemson on Clemson are, but that's where I kind of stand. Yeah, um, I know we talked with Clemson was kind of a team that we talked about earlier as being the surprise of the ACC so far. Um, Obviously, like you said, they have a lot of upperclassmen. They have a lot of guys who've been through college basketball. They know what it takes to win. They know how to win games. They know what not to do to 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 kind of lose games per se. Um, but yeah, I just I don't know yet if they're kind of on that level with North Carolina and Duke. And again, I've like I said, I I don't think you've seen the best of Duke yet. Um, they really haven't had their co- full complement complementary of players yet. They kind of have. A, guys in and out of the lineup. So we'll have to see what they look like. Um, North Carolina, again, I've watched North Carolina a lot this season, and their three losses, they've been in all three of those games down to the wire. Um, and then their wins are just as impressive. Um, like you said, they beat Oklahoma. They beat a lot of good teams. So, like, um, I don't know if they're at that level yet. We'll have to see. Um, but I do think that Clemson has a chance to be the third best team in the ACC come season end. Um, by the way they're playing again, we, they, we have yet to see a team take away what they want to do on offense. And again, it's not easy when you have guys that can beat you one-on-one beat you moving the ball, cutting and things like that. It's definitely not easy, but, um, it'll be, it's going to be a different kind of when the ACC play comes like, like we mentioned, um, in our pod before that, uh, when you play ACC teams, like these guys know you, right? Like they see you every year. They scout all these coaches talk like they, they all know. Right. And they know what you're coming to do and what you want to do. And they're going to try to stop that and make you pivot to something mm-hmm. else. So it'll be very interesting to see. But um, I do think Clemson has a shot to be a top three team in the ACC this year. Brings us to UVA. Right. So Duke at 13 and a half, Carolina at 19, Clemson 22, then UVA all the way up at 40. OK, so UVA has some good wins. Right, they beat twenty three Texas A and M. 
They beat 33 Florida. Um, they have some tough losses to Wisconsin and Memphis, who both beat them pretty handily. Uh, they are about the most stereotypical UVA team I've seen. Um, number three ranked defense, number 139 ranked offense in the country. Uh, there's actually one team playing slower than them right now, which is hard to believe. Um, but they're the, the prototypical UVA type stereotype. Can't be, can't be a power five team, right? Uh, I doubt it. I'll find out real quick. Um, why don't you t- tell us about? Tell me if I about thoughts about UVA, and I'll look that stuff up real quick. What do you think? Yeah, about? yeah, UVA. Um, like you mentioned, it's they're gonna they're gonna grind you out defensively in the half court. Uh, they're not really gonna turn the ball over, so you're gonna have to play half court against them. Playing half court against them is obviously. Uh, you said they're number three ranked defense in the country, right? So yep. it's it's not an easy task, but um, offensively. They're middle of the pack. Um, obviously, they when they played Syracuse, they lit it up. Were not, they were not middle of the pack that night. <laughs> lit it up okay. offensively. But, yeah, I mean, they're going to grind it out. Uh, UVA, this is kind of like when you think of UVA, it's slow, slow pace, slow offense, uh, grind you out. They want games in the f- high 40s to middle of the 50s. That's kind of how UVA wants to play. And this year it seems just like that. So, It'll be interesting, interesting to see in the ACC if anybody can kind of get out and run a little bit against them. Uh, obviously, Syracuse had some success offensively for the first 10 minutes of that game, 12 minutes of that game. Um, and then UVA kind of said, yeah, we're done with this. We know what you're running, and we're going to take that right away. And th- there was no pivot from there. Um, yeah. So it, it'll be interesting to see. But if you're going to play UVA, um, your main goal should be to kind of push the pace and get them to run. Um, the more shots you get and the more shots they get, uh, you're probably going to hit more shots than they will. Uh, they're just not a great offensive team. They they have guys who can hit threes, who can make some plays. Uh, obviously, Reese Beekman is their star. Uh, Ryan Dunn is uh, one of the top defenders in college basketball. Um, they have some guys who can shoot threes, but uh, you kind of want to push the pace a little bit and get, get after it um, up and down the court. Yeah, I, I don't have much to say about UV. Like I said before, I jumped off. Um, also, it's Towson is the only team that plays. Okay. I figured. I figured. <laughs> they're 166, so they're not terrible. But um, so, yeah, so I mean, I, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, we saw what they do. And we saw also what they do when they, when they shoot it well. I'm going to lump these next three together. Um, we got Pitt, Virginia Tech, and Miami. So Pittsburgh is at 44.2. Tech at 49 and Miami at 59. These are three teams that I'm looping together because I don't know about them. Like, I don't know if Pitt is actually that good. Hold on, before before you go, it it, kind of – these are three teams that could potentially jump into a top four of the ACC or kind of jump – fall down into like – I won't say like 13, 14, 15, but like – 9, 10, 11 area. Like there's they, – they if they play to their level and their strengths, they could go up, but they could easily just as well fall down. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. These are kind of enigma, the Enigma teams. Um, like Pitt hasn't really done anything yet. Uh, they've lost their game since top 100 teams, uh, Missouri, Florida, Clemson. Like they – analytically, like the analytics like them, but they haven't done anything yet. So – We'll see about them. I don't know. I, I, I'm just not sold on them. They played Clemson decently, but really Clemson kind of handled them. So I don't know. Um, Virginia Tech is kind of weird too. Uh, they got a good win against I mean, number 12 Iowa State. They beat Boise. Uh, they have losses to South Carolina. They got absolutely destroyed by Florida Atlantic and Auburn. But those are two top 15 Ken Palm teams. Um, I, I've seen them play because, again, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in Virginia. So I see them more than some people do. Uh, and bracketology has them as the 11 uh, last team in. Uh, Miami, uh, they're 10 seed on bracketology. Uh, they haven't really done anything impressive. I mean, they have again, they have three top 100 wins. It'd be 69 K State, 76 UCF, 80, 82 Georgia. Games they're supposed to win. And then their three, their two losses were to Colorado, and Kentucky, and they got destroyed by both of those teams. So I don't know. I mean. These are these are three that I think I'm I'm very unsure about. Um, 
And like, I, I think we'll know a lot about Pitt come obviously on Saturday. Um, Virginia Tech, I don't know who they have next, but Virginia Tech and Miami. I mean, I think Miami's get. I think Miami and Pitt are getting a lot of love from last year um, on this, and they haven't really screwed up too bad yet to to, to lose that. I think Virginia Tech is is just kind of. Uh, I think that Iowa State game is kind of leading them to where they are ranking wise. So, yeah, I don't know what you think about these three guys, but I'm just not. I'm not sold on them, and I'm not also like I also don't think that they are bad. <laughs> yeah. You know so I mean? when you so know. when you look at teams like like Miami, for instance, Miami had this great run last year in the NCAA tournament. Um, obviously, everybody knows about that, but like they lost huge pieces, right? Like Isaiah Wong was arguably their best player last year. Um, Anthony Walker was a good guy to come off the bench. I think he's gone. Yep, he's gone. And then they had um my God, why can't I think of his name? Who was their power forward? The lefty. Um uh, my God. Miller. Yeah, Jordan Miller. Uh so they they lost a lot and Jordan Miller was huge for them in the A uh, NCAA tournament. Like he was him and Isaiah Wong were probably A one and A two or A one and A B for um Miami in the in in the tournament. And like um just kind of looking at their stats, like it's kind of puzzling. Um, I know, like, obviously they're nine and two or ten and two. Um, then, like you said, they Colorado and Kentucky just blew them out of the water, and they kind of beat the teams they were supposed to beat. But they have four guys in double figures. Uh, three of them are shooting over forty-one percent from three. Um, it's kind of puzzling. So obviously. Nigel Pack and Norshan Omir are kind of their two big returning players. Um, Bensley Joseph and Woogie, Woogie Pobler are guys who are getting more of a, more of a chance this year uh, with guys gone. And then Matthew Cleveland kind of transferred in from Florida State. Um, yeah. But like their leading scorer right now is is uh, Woogie Pobler or Wooga Pobler. Uh, he's averaging seventeen and a half a game. Uh, this was a guy who started late for them like ncaa tournament time kind of started some games for them but he was more of a backup guard um it seems like he's really taking advantage of those extra minutes and things like that but they're just kind of they're small right like mm -hmm. norshad omir plays the center and yes he is as physical as anybody else but he's six seven six six so like they're very small um i don't know what the rebounding numbers are i know you kind of have that in front of you um, but like, I, it's, it's kind of like when they play very good and they hit threes, they can beat just about anybody. Right. But when they're not hitting threes, like kind of, where do they go? Is the big question right now. And it, it's kind of the same with Pitt. Pitt last year was a team that when they hit threes, they were one of the best teams in the country because their guards could get downhill when you space the floor and guys can't kind of help in and things like that. Um, yeah. And Virginia Tech, I mean, I know like Hunter Couture kind of missed uh, the beginning of the season. Um, obviously, he's back now. He's a huge piece for them. But these teams are just kind of they lost big pieces and they're kind of trying to figure out how to replace them now. Right. And like that's the big thing in college basketball is when guys leave, guys graduate, guys transfer out because it's so easy to do that now. How do you replace those big minute guys and big pieces to your kind of your team? And that's what those three teams are kind of figuring out right now. Yeah, hundred percent agree on that. Um, I mean, like we've learned a lot, but there's a lot that we don't. There's a lot of mystery still. Like there's a lot that we don't know about. Like, like there's teams game. that they've like Syracuse. We've beaten the teams on our schedule. We're pro we're projected to beat, and then we've lost big to teams that we were projected to lose to. So like. You don't really know, and it's like a lot of these teams are 11, 12, 13, 14 games in, and you kind of, you're kind of you still trying to kind of figure out who they are. And obviously, yeah. like coming in the ACC play, like Syracuse at 9-3, and three, kind of trending a little bit upwards as opposed to downward heading into ACC play, but like now it's a test for all these teams. Now you're playing teams like we've talked about before that, that know you, know what you want to do. And like so how do you play against a team who's going to – take away your number one option or take away your number one play? How do you kind of pivot around that and uh, 
come out victorious in the end. Yeah, it's, it's about to, yeah, it's about to get real. We're gonna learn a lot quick. Um, again, by mid January, we're gonna know a lot about these about these squads. Uh, Miami, just to your point, average rebounding. Uh, they're shooting forty point eight percent from three, and their opponents are shooting twenty seven percent, which is crazy. Like, to, that's probably all the reason that a lot of their success. Yeah, um, they're shooting it well, and they are not getting up a lot of threes. They're also getting to the, they're also keeping teams off the foul line at a pretty good rate. All right, so I, I, I jump, jumble these next four teams together. Um, Wake Forest at 67, NC State at 70, BC at 81, and then Syracuse at 82. So these are teams, I guess, what, seven through – eight through 11. Um, Wake, again, I think is just scratching the surface. I think they're going to be pretty solid when it's all said and done. Um, they lost to Georgia, which is a rough one. They lost to Utah, which is okay. They lost to LSU. They had two or three guys out, um, so don't read too much into that. They have wins over Florida and Rutgers. Again, they haven't beat anybody yet, but I don't know. I just kind of get a vibe watching them play, um, just like I get a vibe watching Miami play, which isn't as positive. I like Wake. I think they have a lot of good pieces. I think they're going to be a problem for teams. Wake is one of those teams I think that can beat literally anybody on the schedule at any night and also potentially lose to almost anybody on the schedule. So that's, that's kind of my, my take on them. Um, better offensively than defensively so far. NC State, I don't, I just don't know about them yet. They are currently 74 in Ken Palm, but they just, I mean, they lost to BYU by nine. They lost to Mississippi by 20. They lost to Tennessee by nine. Um, they beat BC in overtime. They just don't really have anything impressive on their resume right now at all. Um, they probably should have beat Mississippi, but they didn't. But like, and but again, everything else, like you said, has been well. That's where they probably should be right now. You know, like just based on that schedule, which is what makes it hard when like these teams play nobody pretty much, um, or don't have a lot of challenges in their schedule in the non-con. It's kind of hard to get a read on them. But they're not that's doing like anything. One, that's like the one positive, right? When you think of teams like North Carolina or Duke or Clemson, like they've you played know. in competition, so you kind of know what you're gonna see. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And Wake doesn't do anything super well, or NC State doesn't do anything super well or super poorly when you look at stats. So it's just hard to tell with them. Uh, BC, again, is another team that I think um, is going to get potentially make some moves. They have a nice win over St. John's, who's number 44. Um, they lost to NC State in overtime. They lost to Colorado State. They have a tough loss of Loyola by three. Um, but, again, they haven't done – the, the resume is not super great. These two teams, Boston and Wake, play each other on Tuesday the second, so that'll be interesting. Um, and then you got Syracuse, which we won't talk about too much here because that's all we ever do. Um, but uh, when Syracuse rounds it out, right behind BC, at, so ba Boston's at eighty-one point seven five, BC's at eighty-two point two five. So um, Torvik has Boston ranked thirteen spots ahead of Syracuse. And then Evan Maya has Syracuse ranked 19 spots ahead of uh, Boston. And the big difference is Boston's at 74 on net and Syracuse is at 83. So, um, and the really, the, those two are pretty opposite. I mean, Boston has a good offense, defense is struggling. Syracuse is a good offense, uh, bad off, or offense is struggling, and defense is, is, has been playing pretty well, turning teams over. So, I think those four teams right there, um, we'll see. I mean, again, more question marks. Uh, those are teams I can potentially – some of these guys could probably jump up to five or six. I don't know, though. I don't think those teams will drop below to the Florida State, Georgia Tech, Louisville, Notre Dame. No. I think like, there are teams that are going to They'll either, like, interchange between each other or they'll make a couple jumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not – I mean, honestly, you kind of nailed it on the head there. There's not much more to say, but, like – uh, I'll just jump on NC State real quick. So if you look at NC State's first five games of conference, right? I mean, obviously they've already played – I say first five games of conference, but they've already played one. But um, they got two games that they probably really should win. Or Sorry, we'll go first seven games. Um, you got – you're at Notre Dame, which they probably should win. But then you got Virginia, North Carolina, and then at Louisville. But then you got Wake, Virginia Tech, and Virginia again. So out of your first seven games, five of them are against North Carolina, Wake, Virginia Tech, and two against Virginia. 
And then you got a Notre Dame and a Louisville in there. So, like, you're really going to know seven games in what NC State really is, right? Like, you're not, yeah, you're not really starting off. Like, a lot of these teams that we're talking about that are sitting here at 8 through 11 that can are probably going to jump between 8, 9, 10, and then maybe even some can get up to 5 or 6. They're gonna, you're gonna know what a lot of these teams are early because their first five, six conference games are games that are gonna tell you what they are. Syracuse is being one of them, NC State being another one. Uh, I think Wake has a pretty tough schedule to kind of start out to. Um, and then BC, like they've already they lost to NC State, so now they they're kind of getting put behind NC State right now. So It'll be interesting to see kind of what teams do. Um, obviously, like all of these teams kind of have like their go-to guy that you kind of point out. Like we mentioned with um, uh, Syracuse, it's Judah. Boston College, it's kind of quit and post and the things he can do. Um, uh, NC State is kind of DJ Horn. And who was the other one? Wake. Um, I think was, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of uh, right now it's Hunter Salas or Hil Hildrich. So, like, these are the guys that are going to kind of carry you most nights and kind of move your team here, 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 kind of back and forth type of things. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, we got, and I think this is tier four, which I think is really like tier four A and B. Florida State and Georgia Tech are at 104 and 113, and there's a huge jump. To Louisville at 204 and Notre Dame at 223. So, um, Florida State, Georgia Tech, I think potentially could jump into that 8 to 11 range, but I think they're pretty stuck there. Um, Florida State probably has more of a chance just because they're pretty decent defensively, but I just can't see Georgia Tech. Now, again, they have a they have a win over Duke, so who the heck knows? That's a nice little like house money win, right? Like that allows you a little bit of space. Um, but then you got Louisville and Notre Dame. It's going to be a battle for it. That'd be that. That should be what somebody somebody should dedicate the rest of the year to. Who is worse, Louisville or Notre Dame? Like who's going to be who's going to finish last? I hope they play each other twice because that'd be fantastic if they play each other twice. So I um, will say, right? I will say, coming in the ACC play, if I had to choose a team who would finish last over the other, I think Notre Dame kind of figures it out a little bit to where they. I, I think they pick up two or three ACs, three, four, maybe ACC wins, kind of beating the lower echelon ACC teams, maybe getting like an odd victory here or there. But like Notre Dame seems like they're kind of in a better place moving forward than Louisville is. And that's hard to say, but like that, that's kind of the sense you get heading into ACC play. Yeah, I think that's true too. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Even though they're ranked lower, I think that's I think that's true. So, yeah, I mean, um, so there's your ACC basics, all right, in case you haven't – maybe you haven't watched the game all year and you're just tuning in in January because football is officially over. Um, that's kind of what's going on right now. Syracuse right now finds themselves in that 10-11 spot um, analytically and metric-wise, um, which no, I they think – it's They only play each other once. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, 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 I saw. <laughs> Market calendars. Um must see TV. And Ken Palm has Louisville winning 69-64. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so that's kind of what we got right now, right? A lot of question marks in the ACC. Um, and one wait, one thing I one thing I did want to mention um, going over ACC teams, if you haven't watched a lot of ACC basketball this year, outside of Syracuse, obviously, um, there's not many um, – your prototypical bigs in the ACC this year. Like a lot of teams, like, yes, you have your guys like PJ Hall and Armando Baycott and Kyle Philip Philipkowski, but like they're not dudes that like you would picture as a, an ACC big, right? Like you think yeah. of guys that have come through a lot of these programs and like if this is a big if, and obviously we haven't seen it now, but if they could kind of, Syracuse could kind of get Naheem like into the flow of a game not offensively, but just kind of defensively and rebounding and things like that. Like that could be a huge thing moving forward in ACC play. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. And there, there's a lot of things that Syracuse can maybe do. And I think every team has a question mark or two about guys who um, 
might be able to to make things happen for their teams and bump them up a couple spots. And there's a couple teams hinging on other players playing well and then maybe dropping some spots. So, um, all right. So I think maybe we can talk about Syracuse. Let's let, let let's move our Syracuse predictions to uh, the pit preview, right? And we'll kind of we'll, we'll preview pit for you guys. And then we'll uh, break down Syracuse's schedule the rest of the way uh, because there's really no time because Syracuse has uh, Pitt on Saturday. Then they have Duke on Tuesday, the second. Yes. Yeah, Tuesday, Tuesday. Because this this is a uh, the ultimate Sunday reset this year. You got uh, New Year's on a Monday um, to start the year. So um, yeah, so that those are those are two huge games for Syracuse. Um, a lot of potential for them to 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 make some moves nice. there. And then I yeah. think they're at North Carolina that weekend, right? Is it that I weekend? Believe, so I had it in front of me a second ago. I think they're so they got um, <clears throat> they got Boston at home on Wednesday. Okay. So it's Saturday, Pitt, Tuesday at Duke. We got a week off basically, um, and they got uh, BC at home. Then they're at Carolina. Then they play. So they get a week off, and then they play three games in six days. Correct. We play four games in 10 days, five games in 13 days, six games in se- six games in 17 days. It's cra- their schedule um, this year is crazy. It's like every three seven, or four days. Seven games in 20 days. So yeah, it gets it gets real fast. So we'll we'll break all that stuff down for you guys. Um before during our pit preview pod. Because again, we don't want to keep you guys too long here. And you know how we'll just talk for for hours about um, stuff like that. So we'll we'll talk about Pitt on. Uh, we'll give you something for Pitt leading up to the game Saturday, and then we'll talk also about the rest of the Syracuse schedule. Um, any final words you got, Nick? I, I'm good on my end. Um, I think you guys, if you haven't been watching, you have a decent idea of what the ACC looked like today. Uh, we might come back to this pod in a couple of weeks and and reanalyze where teams have moved in the end of the year, but. Uh, right now, that's kind of where we are, and this is without playing each other, right? So, like, this is without ACC teams playing each other. This is all speculation based on current schedules, um, but that is that is the current state of the landscape. You got anything else before we before we get out of here? Yeah, if you guys have any questions or anything about ACC play or about anything that we've talked about, obviously comment uh, and hit us up on Twitter. Um, wh- whatever you got to do, but we're here to answer questions. Um, We'll try to answer you like on social media or on YouTube or whatever. Um, but if not, we'll if it's something that we really want to talk about, we'll bring it on the pod and we'll talk about it. Um, but yeah, like Brandon said, this is kind of uh, what we've seen non-conference from a lot of these teams. Um, the biggest thing I think uh, to take away from this, a lot of teams kind of it's kind of been an odd year where a lot of teams have beat the teams they're supposed to beat and then they've lost to the teams that are higher ranked than them. Um, I know there's been a lot of upsets this year in college basketball, but not so much the ACC. Um, I think the biggest upset you could say for the ACC was probably Georgia Tech over over Duke uh, when they at the time. Um, but really, it's kind of been if you're better than me, you beat me. And if I'm better than you, we beat you. So um, ACC play will show a whole lot for a lot of these teams, um, especially uh, like Brandon said, a couple weeks into the season with, with some of these schedules, like you're really going to know what, what, what you got in your team. So hundred percent. Yep. All right. Well, that's it from us guys. Um, hope you guys had a great Christmas. Um, and, uh, you know, not the new year yet, but we're getting close to it. Um, but yeah, we'll bring you guys all the stuff you need the rest of the way. And it, it's about to get live, about to get live. All right. On behalf of Nick Peckham, um, I'm Brandon Shields and, We will see you guys uh, for pregame on Pitt. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. See you next time.